Can you as a warning? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mayor and Council meeting, our monthly meeting, this uh, October the 3rd, 2017 at 6 p.m. I'll call the meeting to order. We will have our invocation by Council Person Officer McPherson, followed by our Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the beautiful day that we've had, even as we've experienced fall. At the same time, Lord, I know our hearts are heavy with the people that have been hit by natural disasters and then just recently with the actions of, of evil, basically. God, sometimes it's more than we know how to process, but we just ask for protection. We ask for special comfort for those people, that those you send in to assist and help, that you'll just guide them and be there in the healing process. Help us, uh, guide us as we go through the meeting tonight that we would do well in our dealings with the citizens and the issues that come before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, it's always a pleasure to me to recognize our uh, loyal employees out there who give us so much. They're the, the face of our of this council and, and the first folks that you folks see out there, the, the public. So this is certainly an honor for me, and we are recognizing four employees tonight. And uh, the first one is uh, Robert Francis. And uh, Mr. Francis works for our code compliant. He's a code compliant specialist for code enforcement. And uh, Robert, I'm going to ask that you come up. And uh, then I'm going to get everybody's photo. I'm going to come up front after I do the. The, the second person is uh, Shelly Frost, and I, I gave Shelly a hard time. Told her she she had to limit her speech to 20 minutes. So, <laughs> so Shelly works uh, with our police department and does a tremendous job. She's our IT CID now. The CID is what? Criminal Investigation Division. Crim Criminal Division. So Shelly, if you would come forward too. Our. Our third person is uh, Doyle Bolden, and uh, Doyle has been with us 20 years. Doyle is a lab analyst at the wastewater plant, and uh, I can say that I have worked uh, alongside Doyle for many years. Uh, he came on uh, before we had our uh, water reclamation facility and has done a tremendous job for us out there, Doyle. Thank you for your 20 years. And last but certainly not least is Aaron Sims, and I believe Pete is going to accept that. Is Aaron here? Or? Yeah. All right, okay. okay. Uh, Aaron Sims is a Class 1 water operator license, and she works for a water treatment plant. And Pete, I'm, I think this is the person that just recently uh, passed an exam in, in as our Class 1. You want to come up and say a few words about that? I, Our photo taker. Thank <laughs> you. 
are extremely proud of our employees here in the city of Ilrica, and I know you are too. Uh, they again, they're the face of our city, and uh, and I, I couldn't ask for a better group of folks working alongside them for some 14 years. And now as your mayor, uh, I, it is a pleasure for us to always recognize the hard work that that they gave, give us. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we have reached the point of the agenda where we adopt the agenda, and I would like to ask that we add. Uh, for discuss discussion purposes, the old Head Start building on Clubcorn Street. So moved. Second. Hold a motion and second to add that to the agenda. All in favor? Where do you want to put it? Where you going to put it? Uh, let's add it. Governor and Bobby. You want to make it A2? A2 after the minutes. That'd be good. Yep. That's where it was before. Uh, okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay, uh, council updates. I have just one. Um, I've been real pleased that we've been able to have something like a farmer's market and craft down here, and I didn't know they wouldn't be here tonight, so I won't have any tomatoes for the rest of the week. Um, so they may be done for the season, and I didn't, I just didn't know. But the concern is I don't think they're being well supported yet by the community so if it's not the desire of the community we won't have it anymore and that's my concern those people really aren't I don't think making enough money for this to continue if we don't have a better turnout so I don't know if we need to advertise differently what it is we need to do because it really is a nice addition to the mill to have the crafts and to have the uh, fresh vegetables and everything so I just want to throw that out there maybe we can brainstorm and come up with a better way to get the word out Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Okay, I would. Uh, I brought this up in the work session, and I would certainly like to, to remind the audience of, of something very ex special coming up. Uh, we have the vote on the senior tax exemption coming up Tuesday, November the 7th. Uh, most of you know the, the situation with our senior, senior tax exemption coming off for 2017. Uh, it's on the ballot to be voted for, and if approved by the city voters, then it would take effect for no... January the 1st, 2018. So please get out and vote. And uh, if you have questions, please contact me on Facebook or by email, or you can, you know, we've got information at City Hall. So, but uh, find out what the vote is and, and uh, certainly vote your conviction on that day. And of course, in addition to that, we also have uh, up for election council persons in wards three and five. Uh, we had one in ward four, but uh, Councilman McDougal is unopposed. So that election is also the, uh, on that ballot on the 7th. So please get out and vote. Uh, I don't care how you vote, quite frankly. I just want you to vote. It's very important. It's important for our city. So with that said, if there are no other updates, then uh, we have reached the public comment section of our meeting. If you, anyone wishing to speak, please come forward and do so. Uh, sign in, state your name and address for the record, and li limit your comments to three minutes. Good evening. Uh, I've already signed in. My name is Fred Molnar. I live at 1092 South Creek Drive, Villa Rica, Southwood Subdivision. And I'd like to say good evening to you, Mr. Mayor, our Honorable City Council members, Mr. Barber and Mr. Mecklen. I have been a resident and a taxpayer of Villa Rica for over 10 years. Over that period of time, I have been asked to represent Southwoods subdivision in Mirror Lake for my neighbors and friends. That's why I'm here this evening. During the past 10 years, there have been only three homes built in our subdivision. Wow. We have enjoyed and become accustomed to quiet streets, clean neighborhoods, and a pleasant environment. We know all that is about to change with D.R. Horton Builders purchasing the lots in South Pits, and that's why I'm here today. On the agenda is variance 0517. 
requested by Mr. Shea. Is Mr. Shea in the audience? That's a shame. We, are resi we as residents only ask that Mr. Shea and D.R. Horton honor the variance 0517 as stated by our city council as it pertains to lots 26, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 36, and 37. Wow. We need to preserve our green space in Southwoods. So I just hope that the Horton Company will honor whatever the request is or whatever the results are from this city council for the variance 0517. Green space is very important. We also ask that during your construction, D.R. Horton, you respect the neighborhood standards that we have worked so hard to maintain. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Michael Young, 9634 Coastal Point Drive. I also have questions about the two variances from D.R. Horton. I'm wondering, I, I haven't heard it discussed in the last city council meeting when they tabled this. And, and, um, when, did, when did the new buffer ver uh, distances come into effect? When did Villarica change the variances? Was it before or was it after these properties changed hands? The first variance property changed hands October 25th, 2013. So that was four years ago. The second property with the bigger variance, the larger number of lots, changed hands on 22 June this year. So were the, did these properties have changes in, in the buffer requirements on them before or after D.R. Horton took, took over the lots, took title to the lots? That would make a difference to me. If they bought a lot knowing that they were going to have to get a variance in order to do something. That, that tells me that I don't owe a whole lot to that that decision because they knew there was a problem with the property. The other other question I have is how much impact is this not not going to not putting a house on that going to have when both lots were transferred for the sum of ten dollars and other good and valuable consideration. Uh, D.R. Horton got those those all of those lots for ten dollars. Well. 20 if you count the two, two, two titles, 20 bucks. I don't know what the other good and valuable <coughs> consideration is, and it's not public record to my knowledge, so I don't know how much impact not granting the variance has on it, but it doesn't sound like it has a whole lot. Just a couple questions I have. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Hello, everybody. Oh, yeah. I am uh, Kurt Kraft, and I'm too tall for this microphone. Here we go. All right, that's better. All right. I'm Kurt Kraft, 246 Ridge Lake Drive. Um, I'm the chairman of the Villarica Development Authority, and in case y'all didn't know what that was, there's the Downtown Development Authority who handles everything, obviously, downtown. And our Development Authority, we handle primarily the factories and businesses that are trying to come in. We're trying to attract jobs. And I'm the chairman of that. Um, if y'all think what happened with Equifax with the security breach or something, would I tell you what happened with me? On July the 13th, I went up to Russell Cellular, which is an authorized Verizon dealer up here in Villarica, brought in this iPhone and had problems with it. I couldn't get texts uh, from certain people. Come to find out that it was, I couldn't get it from Androids. One of the salespeople, after 30 minutes, figured that out, wiped my phone, and then downloaded somebody else's information to this phone. I got this, and it was a woman in this area who was a former customer of them. I got her pictures, her texts, her emails. I knew who her contacts were. All that was on this phone. They couldn't wipe the phone, or they couldn't get her information off. Um, this dragged on for two and a half hours. I finally left with the phone. Days, days ensued afterwards, 
and got no response from Russell and therefore I hired an attorney not only to try to reach out to this woman but also to protect myself because I didn't know what I was getting into to be very honest with you so um, I reached out locally and didn't get anywhere so I went on my own investigation I contacted the FBI the FTC the FCC the Better Business Bureau another Verizon store Apple computer and finally the GBI um, I know information now that I really didn't want to, it's like when you come down with something and now you're the expert on what you came down with uh, that's what I ended up with here uh, so the bottom line is to this day um, the only good response I got was from the Better Business Bureau the person admitted doing it to the Better Business Bureau and it was just yesterday I noticed that I'm going to leave copies for the council uh, here but in here oh, let me, if I could read that David and this is like I said I guess different agencies work slow but the Better Business Bureau said the business responded to the dispute but failed to make a good faith effort to resolve it so there you have that there you go. thank you David and so therefore because I only got three minutes as you can imagine this is two and a half months of work sitting right here what I'm asking the council formally is that the GBI investigate this um, I think that from what I've been told again is that they have the expertise they have the staff uh, in cyber things like this because to be very honest I have no idea at this point what where my information is when why I mentioned the Villarica Development Authority there were emails of confidential projects that are going on right now that were during that time and before on my email and when my thing happened and then the Equifax thing happened I was like you know you know where is my information to this day they won't admit to what happened as far as accurately uh, locally uh, one of our officers went and asked her a question and until I get more information her reply did not match the reply she gave the Better Business Bureau so once again that's why I'm up here is to just request a uh, because I got the file here if you could wrap it up Mr. Craft I'm wrapping it up right now according to the GBI replied to me you would need to speak to your local law enforcement agency about this issue GBI can only investigate if they are requested at a local level I have done so and I think I did it in three minutes thank you thank you sir Good evening, uh, John Hennebach, 3106 Golfers Way. Um, I'll let some of uh, Mr. Kraft's time spill over to my mind's very quick. Relates to this uh, variance issue though also. Uh, and my question is, why did these variances not come before planning and zoning? We have not seen these, had no knowledge of these. Uh, the variances, why didn't they not come before P and Z? If anybody knows, someone from staff will get, get you that answer, sir. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we will begin our agenda. And uh, the first part of that is our consent agenda. And for those of you that don't know, a consent agenda is a single item that encompasses all things the City Council would normally approve with little comment. Each of these items was discussed at the Thursday, September the 28th, 2017 uh, Council Work Session, and it was the unanimous consensus of the governing body to place the following items on the consent agenda. And those three items are at the addition of a new position for an IT Information Technology Coordinator. Uh, the second one is the addition of a new position for Building Inspector. And the third one is emergency purchase order to replace two failed lift station pumps to avoid spills and loss of customer service. So I would entertain a motion to approve those. So moved. Second. Yeah. Moving a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? It is approved. All right. Tab A, governing body.
you have before you. If y'all wonder what I'm doing up here, by the way, um, this I'm still trying to get used to this. This replaced a notebook. I don't, I don't guess we have any, but the notebooks that we used to have for our commission meetings was about that thick. And uh, so not only are we being more conservative and, and protecting our environment by going paperless, but uh, we'll, we also have a chance to make notes on these little devices up here. Councilman McDougall, I think, is the only one that really I, I can only speak for myself, but, but he's, he needs to give us lessons or me lessons anyway. But I've you can see me kind of fumbling up here a little bit. I have an appointment. So um, he's, uh, but, but I... Thanks to the to the staff for following through on that request, and and uh, Thursday I, I looked at Elisa and I said, Elisa, did it help you with time? So because she, she used to literally spend four days putting our council notebooks together, and, and she said yes. So that was the that was the answer I wanted to that question. So uh, thank you, council, and thank you, administration and staff for, for putting this together. Now if we can just all get used to this, we'll be doing good. Uh, you have before you the, the meeting minutes of the September the 5th, 2017 monthly meeting and the special call meeting on September the 22nd, 2017. Have you had a chance to look at those? And if so, I would entertain a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Motion carries. All right. Uh, tab B, finance. No, that's right. Never mind. I can't read my own writing. Uh, item number two is a discussion of the Head Start building, and I'm going to ask that the applicant come forward and uh, introduce uh, her concept and what she's asking us to, for, and then uh, I think staff will have some things they want to add to that as well. My name is Angela Guyton, and I am trying to lease the building over at 311 Claricorn, the old uh, Head Start building. Um, our intentions is to op reopen up the school for 18-month um, to 5-year-olds. We are a, um, oh, I'm sorry, we are at this point a for-profit business with the intention at some point to transition to a non-profit, but that takes a process of time. So in the meantime, we are for profit. Um, we are coming with uh, early education and also digital learning uh, to this area. So that's our reason for being here. Uh, we came last month um, to place it on the council's uh, agenda and it was tabled over for this month. Uh, and so we're coming back to see what uh, information the city council came up with for us. And then also the information that I obtained from dealing with Kathy as well who originally um, owns the building. Are there any council questions of the applicant? <coughs> well, not of the applicant. I want to hear a presentation from staff. Yeah, we will have. We may have questions for applicants. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I've got one question. <coughs> Excuse me, one question, Mr. Mayor. Um, from a timing standpoint, uh, I mean, the, the city at some point in time may have need for the property that you're wanting to lease from the city. Uh, how much time would you need advance notice from the city that we may need the property back? Uh, well, <laughs> um, that's kind of difficult to answer at this moment because it's a school, meaning that we would have to be able to locate another building um, and then we would have to uproot the students to another location and that mean informing the parents as well that we'll have to be moving to another location um, and then we have to come back to the city to see if there's another vacant building that meets the zoning qualifications and right from the starts qualifications to allow us to access that building as well so um, does your does your school know. year follow the normal school year yes it will follow the normal school process Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. We may have some more questions, so. Mr. Barber. So we we spoke on the phone, and then I called Kathy to talk to one of their uh, reps. I spoke with a young lady named Sherry and explained the situation. She was... Um, only able to tell me that she would pass the information on to their board of directors. <coughs> so, 
the prospect of us negotiating sort of committee to committee a land lease doesn't seem like a very speedy endeavor. But that, I think that's where we're headed. Um, given the fact that I think the applicant has a, a desire for a long-term arrangement, I think that while we're in the process of making that determination about the, the lease, the land lease, and how that works out with the building lease, is that we go ahead and, and look for another facility for the applicant because in the long run, it, that seems to be a better solution than maybe being in that building a year or two and then having to uproot and either not find a building or find a building that's a significant distance from where her, her students are coming from. <coughs> so that's, that's my recommendation to council is that we pursue both options that we look into doing a land lease to see if we can get the cafe building to work but that we also look into what else is available if there is anything that meets that right from the start set of requirements okay and just to kind of frame this for those that may not know what we're talking about right here uh, the applicant has asked for a contract on what used to be the head start building on Claycorn Street uh, that building uh, the land that that building sets on belongs to the city of Eureka. The building was <coughs> leased to Caffey, who ran the Head Start program several years ago. Um, that Head Start building hasn't been, I don't know when exactly it closed, but it's been several years since, since it's been open. And uh, so her request is, is a little bit cumbersome. We can't approve it because the, the original contract, which basically uh, gave Caffey the, uh, the uh, go ahead to, to open that Head Start program, our, our agreement was with CAFI. And uh, so that's where the complication comes in. The contract changes. We would not have a contract. We would still have a contract with CAFI, but CAFI would administer the, the lease on it, as I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. So and therein lies the problem. And, and the difference was that CAFI, which is actually Community Action for Improvement, is a nonprofit organization that was designed, developed to run uh, Head Start programs. And Ms. Guyton mentioned that she is not a nonprofit, and that, that makes a difference to us. Any other discussion? Well, I like the idea that we've maybe come up with a, another location or look to see, because from listening to Ms. Guyton, you don't want to uproot your school. And because that building is on our property and we know that we might need that within the next couple of years, that would complicate, complicate it for you too. So I like the idea that we at least have some other options to look at. This is a question of staff and our, our city attorney. Is it reasonable to think that we would have something by the November meeting and we could uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's hard hard to answer that question because we we're talking about going out and finding another building somewhere, and I don't know what their board schedule is either. Okay, then can we uh, so that our applicant knows when she should come to the meeting and, and not come to the meeting? We'll, can someone from staff get in touch with her and let her know when we we do have that information? So what I'm hearing is that we don't have a timeline because we're dealing with a board, a volunteer board. Is that correct, Tom? Probably. I don't know. You know um, if Caffey's board are they're volunteers? Th they are volunteers, and they're scat scattered out all over the whole West Georgia area. I mean, it's not a localized board. Right, they have they range. have people spread out in a number of different communities. Okay. Just a question: Who owns this big cement block building on seventy eight? Uh, Ryan. Private individual. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know it's a private individual, but the question is, who who owns it? That may be an, an option to for well, those folks to look at, not us. Any other comments? Okay. So we've already closed that portion, sir. Um, unless the council wishes to open that back up. 
Do we have? I don't mind. Okay, come forward, sir. Uh, yeah, took the time to come. Thank you for allowing me to come up. Uh, my name's Darrell Powell. Uh, I'm Miss Guyton's husband. Uh, I'm kind of not overly involved in this, but I kind of know what's going on. I happen to have grown up here. Um, so the idea of this school particularly is the neighborhood itself. It's a slum and blight type of looking issue for this particular neighborhood. Uh, it's a low income neighborhood. And so the efforts to bring such a product to this particular area um, could help advance the community at large. Uh, we just left from Ms. Brooks's thing over here at Glanton Heisman and they have the lab ready, but we don't have the three-year-old child, four-year-old child getting ready from this particular area with less income, less access to digital literacy to go to the school and be ready to compete. So it's not just the issue of the building itself. I think it's the people, the locale, and the income bracketing that would be of more assistance not only to uh, just the students, but to Villarica at large. Uh, times are changing. My wife's from uh, California, Berkeley, so a lot is changing in terms of digital literacy. And uh, these students, they need to be ready. They need to be ready to compete 20 years from now. They are our future. So if we leave them behind and uh, it become a social issue here inside of Villarica, competing for money, less jobs, uh, then we might be looking at something different 20 years from now. So I think that's the idea of looking forward. We know you all have plans for the land. Uh, we'd be willing to try to do something with that. Uh, if you want to sell us the lot that the building is on, maybe that's something we could do. But uh, that's what I wanted to say. And let me just say this too, sir. Um, there's not a person up here, an elected official or staff person, that, that doesn't believe that what you're doing is, is very noble. And, and we see the need for that. Uh, but we have an obligation to, to make sure it's done correctly and legally. So that's, that's where we're at. I understood, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wishing to come forward in public comments? The lady that walked in may want to come Ma'am, do you want to come? <laughs> no, that's not, that is not kind. <laughs> that's my wife, y'all. You know. Um, she said that's not funny, by the way. <laughs> see, we're not deciding whether there's a need there or not. We recognize there's a need. The problem is you need the location, but... If we were, for instance, to run a road through there, that's a problem for the city. So that's what we're that we're trying to resolve that along with um, location and the fact that one entity owns the building, but we own the land. <laughs> Sorry to have to make you come so many times too. It's it's a little complicated and gets drawn out over a number of meetings. But thank you. Thank you, Councilperson. All right, uh, tab B, finance. I don't see Sarah, so are you there? Sarah is at the Georgia GFOA conference and will be back Thursday. So are you going to give her a financial report? I was not planning to. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen it, but I've never, I've never tried to present it. Is there anything you'd like to bring our attention to on it? Is there anything different than last Thursday? No. <laughs> we did here at Thursday. So water and sewer didn't get in the black since then? or? No, uh, we're working on it. <laughs> okay. I, I will, I'll just make a comment in general here. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I understand that our staff has uh, have other things to do. But uh, I would certainly, if, if there's an agenda item that, that's on here, I would like for a staff person to be here to, to talk about it or in, in lieu of that, would like for you to do that. So uh, I think that our, uh, the council deserves that and I think the, the citizens want to see that as well. So just a broad st sweeping comment. Mr. Mr. Mayor, also, <coughs> we can reference to the public since that they were not here, or many of them were not here for the work session, that the financial report as presented by the uh, by Sarah is online and they can they're welcome to read it because that's how she presents it is through the written financial report <laughs> if, if, if anyone in the public's interested in it just for fun okay moving on to tab C community development 
First item up is variance VA-04-17, variance request from Sean P. Shea, comma, D.R. Horton, Incorporated. Is the applicant present? Okay. okay, please come forward. State your name and address for the record, please, sir. Hi, um, Chris Cole, D.R. Horton, 8800 Roswell Road, Sandy Springs, Georgia. Um, my name is Chris. Sean is not available this, this evening, and so myself and uh, Jonathan Davis are in attendance. Um, Jonathan, I believe, uh, met with some st staff members earlier in the week to discuss this particular application. Um, I walked in a little bit late and didn't hear the um, beginning statements um, that were originally announced during the uh, uh, public comment. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a situation where we're a home building company. We're, um, we're buying lots out here. We discovered that there were some issues um, related to these lots. And my understanding was there were some discussions that had taken place early on in our due diligence process and some expectations set and those expectations had changed after we had purchased the lots and so we're just trying to fi figure this out um i think the main point here was the final plat had been recorded in 2004 and i think your ordinance had changed in 2006 which ultimately led to the requirement of these variances and based on some information that we saw um, there's probably some you know some homes that are existing that um are, are in the same situation that we're proposing um, on these particular lots and if you have any further questions um i'm here to answer them and again we're here to try and get this worked out i, I do have some some comments first of all i think that answers one question that was asked by in public comment but um what the uh, the neighbors did get up and, and speak about was uh their concern that uh, you would come in and maintain their level of privacy to the extent that you can uh, during the building process. These are established neighbors that have been here since when it began and uh, I would certainly like to re put that in the, the minutes and, and read that into the record that that, uh, that we would, as elected a body would expect that of you and hope that to the extent possible uh, that you observe all of their uh, rights as, as neighbors uh, including when you're going to start construction that in the morning when you're going to end in the evening uh, according to all our codes and uh, that you just respect their privacy and their their rights in the neighborhood yes we will do that and uh, there's a set of covenants that we have to abide by as well that help respect and preserve the value of the community and quite frankly that's one of the reasons that we're interested in it because we would expect the same thing from anybody else and um, we'll, I'll take it a step further and we'll make ourselves available to meet with residents with HOA as if there are issues um, we're going to respect the ordinances um, and again you know if there's something that we are not doing that we're supposed to be doing um, we try and step up and have conversations with those who are concerned and with the surrounding stakeholders um, this is we've been doing this for a long time and especially recently coming out the most recent recession we've been involved in a lot of these vacant developed lot communities and the great thing is um, we've made some mistakes and we've learned some things and we've improved on it. So now um, we're a little better educated as we go into um, some of these communities. I'm glad to hear you say that. And those individuals are here in the room and one of them's wearing an ugly shirt right now that says Georgia Tech on it. So uh, I would love for you to stick around and maybe after the, the meeting you could get with them and, and uh, answer some of their questions and start that process. I think that's the main thing if it gets approved that we we start the process off right and continue and uh so mm -hmm. any, anybody else mr barber as we discussed thursday night in work session it appears that the the history of these properties suggests that the ordinance that established these two buffers indeed uh, were approved by council after the properties were platted, which creates a grandfathered condition for those properties. My take on this at this point is that whether we had to technically require the applicant to apply for a variance is a question in my mind, and maybe the city attorney can help me with that, but if we knew that this was a grandfathered condition, 
do we still go through the process of a variance? Is that re required or is that just no exceeding caution on the P and Z department? If this was, if the order of the plat approval came before the change in the ordinance, yeah, it, uh, it would have created a vested right based on the conditions when it was approved. And um, I, I would agree when, 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 they came in, when they came in, they should have been told that they already had the right to do it. Okay. I just want to reiterate that we're not talking about the state buffers. That question came to me. Right. All, All right. we're talking about here is the additional Villarica buffers that came into effect in 2006, mm -hmm. right. about two years after these properties were platted and approved. Mm -hmm. So the truth is that they probably should never have come before us to begin with. Right. But here we are. Correct. Right. I, I would agree with that. This, that's the correct legal conclusion. Right. The, 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 the practical con concern that I have is you've got a couple of these that sit feet from the state buffer which you can't disturb. So to me, that, that that's your it, that's your bigger technical issue is how do you build a house that's got a corner of the, pro, of the structure that's three feet from the buffer and never get in the buffer. So if you can do that, you got you got Mr. George Tech back here shaking his head at you. So <laughs> I think, I think, I think be that's, watching too. you know, what, what they're concerned about are, you know, significantly, uh, significantly mature group of trees that run along that creek that they don't, that they'd like to see maintained you know and and that's more than just knocking into the trees that it, that you know involves the root system and how you know how close you get with the equipment and so I think if you can work with them you know you could have a good project here I know these are tough lots to build on so if they were the best lots they'd have been built on first and they're not so good luck and I wanted to say this too because it was mentioned and we don't respond to public comment directly but um, I do agree that anything that, that's that's a variance to a planning and zoning issue should go before PNZ before it comes to this council so you know I, I, don't, I guess I'll take ownership of that but, but we have you know hopefully we're going to get a stable staff here fairly quick uh, Janet came and then left and uh, so we will get a stable staff here and, and we will get back on task and, and make sure that all things are done that way. So uh, we will also have a city engineer for the first time in the, the city's history, as far as I know anyway. Uh, there hasn't been one here since 2001. I know that for a fact. So uh, that's, that's going to help with the process and hopefully lend some, some uh, uh, well-deserved or well-needed expertise in some of these areas that we deal with. So excited about the, the future prospects. I would like to know, is it your explanation also the reason why I never did go before PNC? Uh, th I, I don't know that for a fact, probably. Uh, I mean, it, I really don't know, but it shouldn't have ever, it shouldn't have gone to PNC because it shouldn't have ever come before we all as a very request to first. begin with. It's already approved. How would we handle that? Do we want to still try to vote on that or do we want to... If it doesn't require it, it doesn't make sense for us to vote on right. it. Right. I don't know that we need to have a... a uh, a vote on approving a variance that's not really needed. I, I think it might be appropriate, however, based on my recommendation to you that I believe that they already have the vested rights in the buffers that existed when the subdivision was platted for you to formally vote that that they have vested rights in that as, as it existed when the subdivision was platted. Okay. I have Someone a question. Else? Well, it's related to the fact that maybe the fact that we don't have the stability in that department and, and it's caused this confusion. Did they not have to pay a fee to ask for this variance? And if so, if it's our fault because of our lack of stability in that department that the ball got dropped, should we not be obligated to refund that fee? Do you know, uh, do you know if there was a fee charged? Tom, can you run that down? I think that's a very, very good point. I, I, I agree with that as well. And maybe an apology, too, for I mean, they've made a getting our act together. More <laughs> than a couple. One, one other point, just even though we don't respond to public comments, I think it was it struck me that I wanted to uh, 
correct the record for anybody else who might be sitting out there in the audience who's concerned. The, the fact that the deed said $10 and other good and valuable consideration is not a reflection of what the purchase price with was. Virtually every deed is always going to say $1 and other good and valuable consideration or $10 or $100 because you're not required to, to show what the actual purchase price of a lot is on the deed. And it's common and customary to use that bland language. One way you can tell is to look on the transfer tax, though, and then fi figure out how much was, was paid for the lot. Way. Okay, David, here, here's a $64,000 question now. Do we need public comment on this, or is this just... No, I, I, you don't need any public comment. I mean, this is a, it's a legal matter. Tom was exactly right. Uh, it, it is a vested rights determination, which is a determination that doesn't require any type of public comment. I will move to approve the VA-04-17. We're going to take them one by one, I assume. No, we're not yeah, let me, let me uh, make, uh, make, make, it for make it a motion uh, that I think the motion should be that you remove these two items from the uh, agenda because the legal determination has been made that they already have vested rights to follow the 2004 approval. Okay. I'm in my motion to remove items one and two, which the two variances requested from the agenda. Second. A motion second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Mr. Barber will get, can you get that information? We'll get that to you, sir. That's okay. Okay, uh, moving on to item number three, which is a alcohol beverage license for Luther's Bistro. It's ABL-06-17. Is the applicant present? Mm -hmm. Please state your name and address for the uh, record and uh, tell us what you want to do. My name is Adam Anderson, uh, 901 South Carroll Road, Luther's Bistro. So, um, Mr. Luther, um, we just changed the names. We took it out of the nonprofit over to a profit, so we had to change it from the charity. So I had to put it into my name, and by doing that, we had alcohol, wine, and beer. So we're just now here trying to reestablish it to get those customers back. And might I say that you have one of the best steaks I've ever ate. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Selfless, uh, non-promoted uh, advertiser for you. And he cooked it. <laughs> I, I did hear, though, I, I wanted to say something to, to what the applicant said uh, is a question. Just to, I want you to confirm this, is that you've had customers that have actually walked into the restaurant and uh, when they found out they couldn't order wine uh, with their steak or whatever they were ordering, they turned around and left. Is that... By the dozen, Mr. Mayor. By the dozen. Okay. Any questions of the applicant? I would make a motion that we approve. Well, I think we need to see. We have to have a hearing. We have to do public mm -hmm. comment. Uh, I don't think that there were any type of uh, objections listed, but it never hurts to uh, accept public comment if anybody has it. Okay. Are there any other questions of the applicant? Okay, if not, uh, Sir, we're gonna we'll have public comment. Anyone wishing to come forward and speak for or against? You can go ahead and sit down. Anyone wishing to speak for or against this uh, al alcohol beverage license? Uh, please do so. Okay, seeing none, the uh, discussion reverts back to the council for a swift action. I'll make a motion. Oh, hold on a second. The only complaint I got with this whole bunch is they quit serving breakfast. <laughs> So you would you like me to add that to the motion? <laughs> uh, before you make the go motion, ahead. go. Hang on, to, you might you might want to just hang on just yeah. a minute before he yeah, makes the motion. We've got you need to read something yeah. to him. He's already yeah. been. That's already been done. That's already been done. He's leaving. He needs to go. What are you doing? No, but that's already been done as far as reading the concept. Let me make a motion that we approve this alcohol beverage license for Luther's Bistro. Second. Second. Have a motion. A second. Discussion. Not all in favor. It is unanimous. And David, would you read our st statement yeah. to the applicant? You, you have served alcohol before, so you're familiar with the uh, ordinance that uh, requires that you're only serving to people over age. And uh, you understand that the city police department runs sting operations all the time and is going to be trying to 
get your employees to uh, not not follow the process, but I'm co confident that you understand that and will obey the law. Yes, sir. All, all the time. Uh, I believe the, the question was asked today about when he could get his license tomorrow in the morning. Thank you. Go cook Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> okay, tab D. Chief Mansour, or like, or maybe a captain. Is captain going to do this, or chief? Stand up. Oh, he is standing up. Never mind. <laughs> no. I, I'm sorry. He's, <laughs> I couldn't help it. It's just, That's a cheap show. <laughs> I couldn't see him back there. <laughs> oh, I have three people. Got those stepping stools. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. This is a request for us to use money that was already budgeted for other equipment to use to purchase police detective vehicles, uh, and the money was uh, from the accounts, as you see. Uh, in your packets <coughs> we have spoken to uh, our Ford dealership and have uh, spoken to him about two different vehicles one's a Ford Fusion uh, 2016 with 26,000 miles one's a Ford Escape 2014 with 31,000 miles both of them are certified pre-owned which means there's a 12,000 12 month warranty as well as a hundred thousand mile powertrain warranty on them chief what would these two vehicles be used for i believe you're replacing two vehicles now they're high mileage 2010 correct we'll be using them for detectives uh and those vehicles will be used for officers to drive the old vehicles will be used for officers to drive it to training and for the administration to use to like go to the bank and stuff like that okay so you'll be holding on to the old ones we will be holding on to the old ones for now correct you know how we have that plan of how many vehicles we were going to do per year does this like put us ahead of the game because you had some budget money to move it does these these are cars <laughs> for the detectives so they don't yeah those are all the, the patrol other. vehicles right. okay uh also miss coach best i do have those numbers that you requested for the uh, detectives take home cars and how far they drive them so the, can I the, present those to you the, the question that I had the other day and the reason this is on this uh, instead of the consent agenda uh, was the question that when it said pre-owned I, I was to the understanding that meant it was individually owned and was traded in and that's not the issue these are program cars correct I did. I did. I made. I called to make sure, and they, these were program cars, which meant that somebody from Ford dealership, high level places, just drove them around and whatever. They were not individuals on the street that drove these cars. Okay. So I just want. That was the reason I wanted to make sure in our meeting tonight that everybody understands that we don't go out and put, and take individually owned cars and put, and make police cars out of them. Correct. So, thank you. Good. I commend you on doing a good job because we're basically getting two vehicles here, uh, a Fusion and an Escape for a total of $29,750. Yes. Correct. Yes. I move to approve this uh, purchase. Can I ask there. just one other? Aren't the detectives, uh, excuse me, sorry, aren't the detectives on call? Yes, ma'am. So wherever they are, they may have to they get do to have a to scene. Respond. Okay. Especially on a, a major event, they come out, all of them come out. If we have a major event, they all come out. Yes, ma'am. But if we have a minor event, Captain Shaddix comes out. <laughs> and we never want that to happen again, but uh, we understand that that's not possible. So, Any other questions of staff? I think I heard a motion. Yes. Do I hear a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Was that a yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Head shake. Now let me navigate back to the main page. Okay, tab, tab E, Parks, Recreation, and Leisure Services, Ms. Coleman. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon. 
The item that I have before you is concerning the Nugget Drop Fireworks Display uh, Contractor Recommendation. This um, is in the amount of $4,000. Um, as you know, the department hosts its annual uh, fireworks display. And this year we put out to bid this contract. We got two respondents back. The respondents were East Coast Pyrotechnics, Inc. and JM Displays. What you have in your vendor packet, these are, excuse me, the bid comparison sheets for what was submitted. Um, we have J&M displays at 3,010 total shells in the inch and a half to two inch range with um, 1,680 for East Coast Pyrotechnics. Staff is making a recommendation for the approval of J&M displays. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is what would be my third nugget drop. Um, and specifically, probably my fifth fireworks display event. This is a new recommendation of a vendor. Um, I will tell you that um, there's a little bit of history, um, which is why this is kind of becoming the first time that this vendor is being recommended. Um, just so you have an understanding there, um, I would probably say that as, as staff, we probably had, there was a little bit of pause for the first couple of years. Um, we're beyond a window of time, if you will, where uh, this particular uh, vendor, they did have an incident at um, where they had an issue with a display, uh, but they came back uh, the following year and um, had to redo a display for a customer, if you will. That is outside of the window, um, and I'm bringing it up that this is my third year, um, coming up on doing a third year of the nugget drop. So now that we're at a time, like I said, I had a little bit of pause, but now that you know we're beyond a window of time, I'm making a recommendation uh, on this particular vendor. I think um, certainly um, that if you look at what the value that is being proposed, that it's certainly worth uh, the city staff uh, making a recommendation for city council to consider um, approving this contract. Looks like they actually had quite a few more shells and larger shells. Is that right? Yes. I'm not an expert on these things, but I looked at the comparison that is correct. shape that you had. Okay. Ms. Coleman, I had a couple, some questions on it. Um, Notice, looking at the comparison of the two companies, J&M Displays and East Coast Pyrotechnics, uh, it appears that the, the, the largest number of extra shells were in the um, opening barrage, which they had uh, J and M displays had 349 shells, two inch or one and a half inch in size, and then in the body of the program, which is the main part of the program, they had 198 two inch shells. Uh, have you talked to the uh, fire marshal to make sure we could shoot two inch shells off the top of the Avanti building next next door? Um, this is the same specs. I haven't had the a new conversation this year, but these are essentially the same specs um, that go out every year and as far as I'm aware it's capped at two inches for this location so um, we so have modified if you will the the previous specs so that is my understanding of the size limit cap so the, the fire marshal has approved the use of two inch shells in a close proximity show which is what this is correct and these are the again the same uh, standards that have been used at this particular site. We didn't modify or increase the size of the shells for the mill. We can verify that again, Mayor. Well, I would say that the mayor has a lot of experience with these fireworks shows, so I'm waiting to hear if he, if he knows something different. But just looking at, at what I've been presented, it looks like the J&M displays has a lot more shells and some larger shells. It looks like it's hard not to go Better with value. Yeah. And twice the liability insurance. Yes. And, and so that everyone understands, like this is, um, again, this, I guess the same specifications that have gone out for the last several years that, uh, under what has been permitted. So Bo Both companies met the minimum requirement for liability, correct? That is correct. Yeah, I, I, I have re reviewed the contract also, and it looks ex in a 
in an acceptable form. I'm ready to make a motion that we approve, but do we want to wait and find out that question on the fire marshal, or would you? Would there be? <coughs> would there be another? Uh, I guess set up if if that didn't if, if there was an issue with the two inch without you having to come back here. What would we recommend? Just approving it, David. Yes, I, I think you just need to approve it, and uh, if there is a problem, which doesn't sound like there is but I, I agree okay uh, so I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, the nugget drop, nugget drop fireworks display for J and M second, second. a motion and multiple seconds any further discussion if not all in favor it is unanimous thank you ma'am okay uh, David do we have any thing that we need to go in the executive session for where we go? I, I don't have anything. Mercy purchases. We did have consent. Yeah, we did it on the Senate. Okay. Uh, hearing no executive session, I would entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor? Okay. We are adjourned. It and Chris Pike is in the back of the room and didn't have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Sounds like you need to get to work. It's close. Yeah. Did I do good? Hey, I'm too good. Too good. <laughs>